Welcome to this video lecture on blood cells, where we will review the important white blood cells that you have been learning about in the histology course, as well as other important cells found within and outside blood vessels. My name is Christopher Demas, and I will be guiding you through these topics. In this lecture, I'm going to be focusing on the key elements of each of the blood cells to give you a better familiarity with these topics and to help you identify these cells by drawing their key features seen on right Giemsa stain. Also, as mentioned before, I'm going to subdivide cells into those found within the blood vessel and the cells that are found only outside of the vasculature in the mature form. However, pay close attention to the location of the cells found outside the vessels since the blood cells mentioned are not found in the same part of the body. To start off, I'm going to draw in some red blood cells here. They're probably the most recognizable and most defining feature of the blood, so I figured I would start here. It makes most sense to first begin with the overall composition of blood. Let's imagine that a person donates some blood and puts a fraction of their blood in this 10 milliliter anticoagulated test tube. Over the course of time, the cells within the blood would settle out from the liquid part of the blood and would form three distinct layers. On the bottom would be the red blood cells or erythrocytes, which makes up about 40% of the blood volume. The layer of cells just above the red blood cells would be the white blood cells and platelets, which are collectively known as the buffy coat layer, which makes up approximately 1% of the blood volume. Lastly, on top is the liquid part of the blood that typically suspends the blood cells, which is called plasma. Plasma contains a number of proteins, including albumin, fibrinogen, immunoglobulins, and hormones, as well as other nutrients such as vitamins and salts. Let's take a look at where this blood came from. We will start by examining the blood cells found within the vessels, such as red blood cells and white blood cells. Since red blood cells are the most abundant cell type within the blood, we will start by discussing them. Notice their unique shape and size. Red blood cells are of course responsible for gas exchange in tissues within the body by bringing oxygen to the target tissues and removing carbon dioxide from the tissues. Red blood cells are optimized for carrying out this function since their biconcave disc shape makes them quite flexible and increases their surface area for gas exchange. In addition, red blood cells do not contain a nucleus in their mature form. This is once again to optimize its storage of hemoglobin for gas exchange. Next, we're going to focus on the five types of white blood cells found within the blood. We will investigate their key functions and features visualized on right Giemsa stain. I will start with the most abundant type of white blood cell and proceed to the least abundant. I also want to note that special care has been taken when drawing each of the cells, and they will be depicted to the correct size relative to one another. I will also point out when size comparison is important. Let's introduce our first white blood cell, the neutrophil. Neutrophils normally consist between 50 to 70% of the white blood cells in our blood, and thus I'll give them an equal slice of the blood vessel. Neutrophils have two key features that you should commit to memory. First, neutrophils are granulocytes, meaning that they are immune cells that contain important enzymatic granules within their cytoplasm. These granules are neutral staining, so therefore neutrophil granules are neutral in color and they can be difficult to see on right Giemsa staining. However, the cytoplasm often looks lumpy, which I've tried to replicate here. Neutrophils also have a deep purple staining nucleus, which forms a lobe structure. The number of lobes that the nucleus has is variable, and can range between three to five lobes for a normal neutrophil. I have added three neutrophils with differing number of lobes to emphasize this range in number of lobes. In terms of function, neutrophils are very important first responders to an acute response to injury and are responsible for forming pus. Next, I'm going to draw the second most abundant white blood cell known as a lymphocyte. Lymphocytes make up between 25 to 35 percent of the white blood cells in normal conditions, and I'll also give them their respective slice of the blood vessel as represented here. The key feature to identify lymphocytes is the relatively large, dark, intensely staining purple nucleus surrounded by a scant cytoplasm. We often use lymphocytes to gauge the relative size of red blood cells nearby. A good rule of thumb is that a normal red blood cell should approximate the size of a normal lymphocyte nucleus, as shown here. Lymphocytes are different from neutrophils in many ways. They are much longer lived and recirculate throughout their lifespan, but one additional area I would like to emphasize is that lymphocytes are agranulocytes, meaning that they do not contain any granules within their cytoplasm. A way to help you remember this is that since the cytoplasm is already so thin and small, 
it wouldn't have any space anyway for granules. Lastly, lymphocytes are important immune cells for the specific or adaptive immune response and consists of B and T cells. The next category of blood cells we are going to cover is monocytes. Monocytes are immature blood cells that ultimately become mature macrophages once they leave the blood and enter the tissues, and we will discuss this process more in a little bit. Monocytes are the third most abundant white blood cell type, making up anywhere between 3-7% to of the white blood cell content. The key features of the monocytes is their size, as they are the largest cell within the blood. Monocytes also contain a rather large nucleus that typically is kidney-shaped and off-center, as shown here. They are also a granulocytes. These cells are important since they ultimately become macrophages, which are important phagocytic cells that are recruited to the tissues for immune defense and cytokine production. As you can see, there is only a small percentage of white blood cell content remaining, and we still have to cover two more cell types. These remaining cell types are quite important, even though they are not as prevalent within the blood as the first three. The next most prevalent cell type is the eosinophil, which makes up 1-3% to of the white blood cell content. I find the eosinophil to be quite striking. It contains bright pink-orange granules and a deep purple bilobe nucleus. No other cell looks like this. You might at first confuse eosinophils with neutrophils due to their similar size and presence of granules, but realize that eosinophils have a bilobed instead of a 3-5 to lobe nucleus, and their granules are bright pink and orange compared to the neutral stain granules of neutrophils. Eosinophils are important for phagocytosis and killing parasites, and you will be learning more about this in your immunology lectures. The last cell type I would like to mention that is also a granulocyte and forms the remaining 1% of the white blood cell composition of the blood is the basophil. I also happen to love how this cell looks on right Giemsa staining. The cell contains many large, dark purple granules that often obscure the irregularly shaped nucleus. Basophils play an important role in hypersensitivity responses, which you might remember is similar to the role of a mast cell. Now let's step back and look at all the drawn white blood cell varieties. When drawing, I arrange the cells not only in the order of abundance, but also arrange the cells with the granulocytes on the right, including the neutrophil, basophil, and eosinophil, and the agranulocytes, such as the lymphocyte and monocyte, on the left. This is an important distinction, and something I emphasize since I felt it is important for you to remember. A mnemonic that helped me to remember the order of prevalence of these cells was the phrase never let monkeys eat bananas for neutrophil, lymphocyte, monocyte, eosinophil, and basophil. Knowing the relative abundance of the types of the white blood cells becomes important when you are looking at peripheral blood smear slides in the lab. For example, you should expect to see many neutrophils. However, it is unlikely for you to find the same number of eosinophils and basophils since they are more rare cell types. Now that we have focused on red blood cells and white blood cells found within the blood, we will now turn to cells whose mature form aren't found inside the vessels, but found elsewhere. The first cell type I would like to draw in is the megakaryocyte. This cell type is very large in comparison to all the other cell types we have been describing up until now. Megakaryocytes are found adjacent to the sinusoids or blood vessels of the bone marrow. Megakaryocytes are responsible for forming platelets, which are anuclear cell fragments that bud off from the megakaryocyte. These platelets then enter the blood and are transported systemically. The last blood cell type that I want to revisit is the macrophage. The macrophage is a mature form of the monocyte, which can be found in its mature form within the tissues of the body. Macrophages are primarily involved in innate immunity and phagocytosis of foreign bodies within tissue. As monocytes mature, they become larger to form the macrophages as seen outside the blood vessel. I would like to note that even though both the macrophage and the megakaryocyte are both found outside the blood vessel, megakaryocytes are found exclusively in the bone marrow or medullary cavity of the bone, while macrophages can be found throughout the body in any tissue. And with that, we are finished with the topics for this lecture. Let's take a moment to review what we have learned in this segment. First, we talked about the general composition of the blood, which includes red blood cells, white blood cells and platelets which make up the buffy coat layer, as well as the liquid part of the blood called the plasma. Red blood cells make up the vast majority of the cells within the blood. Next, we focused on white blood cells and the five types from greatest to least prevalence, including the phagocytic acute response neutrophil, the lymphocyte involved in adaptive immunity, monocytes, which are the immature phagocytic macrophages, eosinophils involved in the parasitic defense, 
and basophils, which are involved in hypersensitivity reactions. Make sure you review the key features of each of these cells that has been highlighted in the drawings, and whether these cells were located on the right, meaning it is a granulocyte, or on the left, indicating it's an agranulocyte. Finally, remember that some mature cells are located outside of the blood vessel, such as the megakaryocyte in the bone marrow that form platelets, and macrophages within the body tissues, which are the innate immune phagocytic cells for the body. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you found this lecture to be helpful.